are the spark plugs. Is that the dipstick? Or am I the dipstick? You know what? I think it's time to go to class. That's this week on Motoring 2000. TSN's Motoring 2000 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. This week we're in Ottawa, the nation's capital, and of course home to the House of Commons. But don't touch that dial. I promise you we will not be talking about politics. Now we're here in Ottawa to meet a young lady who grew up in Saskatchewan with one goal, to have a career as an auto mechanic. Well, she reached that goal, although the road was a rocky one. But today, Charlene Hayes has a new challenge to help young people realize their dream and also to ensure the journey is smooth. We'll just pull you off your engine for today, okay, because we have these four to do. I got that part for the uh, engine on the probe, that spacer on the rocker arm shaft that broke. That has to be replaced. Growing up on the farm with four brothers, Charlene Hayes found she enjoyed working on the family car and farm machinery much more than doing housework. But later, she quickly discovered that in the big city, auto mechanics was strictly a guy thing. But she never gave up, and after receiving a break at a local Ottawa dealership, Charlene received her license two years ago. Today, she runs the auto mechanic shop at MacArthur I Vocational High School. Be washed. I, I teach uh, automotive all day long at, uh, at the high school to students who choose this class. It's an optional class, and uh, there is usually quite a number of students who want to get in and take the class, which makes it very easy to teach. They want to be here. They're eager. Um, they want to work with their hands, they want to learn about cars, whether it's a hot rod car or just basically changing oil. Um, or students who are interested in being mechanics, um, they can come through here for their entire educational career with MacArthur and uh, work their way up to a co-op and then possibly getting hired on as an apprentice at a garage. This side is done. You just have to put the shoe back on this side underneath here. Okay. We work on cars here um, almost every day and they also get a, a good portion of theory to relate to what they're doing on a vehicle so they understand what they're doing and why, um, how to diagnose problems, how to diagnose noises, um, engine problems, um, basically everything and they have to repair it, especially if they break something. <laughs> they learn how to uh, fix what they break. Okay, and then we have to torque it down to it a specific spec. A lot of them It'll come take from the homes where there are single parents or group homes. And so they have more needs other than just educational needs. And uh, so we try to help them out in all those different areas. Um, by the time they graduate from MacArthur, we're aiming them towards the world of work. Um, that may involve going to a college like Algonquin College in an apprenticeship program as a young person or heading right out into the world of work through our co-op program that lines up these and you see the way these go on too okay see the little rub marks here mm -hmm. that's where the guides have hit some of the cars are, are the teachers if they need uh, work done on their vehicle they'll come and talk to me and say this is what I'm hearing I don't know what it is can you look at it and uh, I'll bring it in we'll Probably discuss it with the uh, students some of the cars the, the other vehicles that are in here right now are from the community people who live in the community so we have you know strong community support that way there were a lot of people who couldn't accept the fact that a woman could be an auto mechanic um, how about a teacher What's it? Um, for the students it's no different it's a teacher is a teacher you know, the first few weeks I was here, they, they were asking, or when the new term would start, you know, are you a licensed mechanic? Are you really, miss? You know, mm -hmm. you don't mind getting your hands dirty? That kind of question, but I'm, they've never asked anything other than that because I'm still a teacher at the front of the class. 
I'm very happy here. Um, I really, really enjoy working with the, with the students and that's, you know, one of the main things of, of um, being a teacher is, is to do as much as you can with the students and help them out as much as they can, learn as much as they can. If they're happy leaving here, that they feel good, um, that they enjoy what they're doing, um, to me that's, that's uh, you know, where the, all the rewards come from for sure. Bombs, bullets and landmines, a soldier's life is a dangerous one. But I'll tell you what his biggest danger is later on Kenzie's Corner. You know, if we're to preserve the environment, we've got to reduce our dependence on fossil-based fuels. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the Honda Insight, the world's most fuel-efficient vehicle. Believe it or not, this thing sips fuel at a rate of 3.2 litres per 100 kilometres, or 88 miles per gallon. The secret to Insight's incredible economy is down to three things aerodynamics, weight and the mode of propulsion. The perfect aerodynamic profile is that of a teardrop. Not coincidentally, if you look carefully at the Insight, you'll notice the body mirrors that profile, delivering a drag coefficient of just 0.25, the slipperiest car in the mass-produced world. Beneath that slippery bright work is an all-aluminum monocoque that is extremely strong, yet represents a weight saving of over 40% when compared to a similar steel body. This, the lightweight powertrain, the use of composite materials delivers a car that tips the scales at a mere 852 kilograms. The real insight story is the powertrain and the clever manner in which the gasoline engine and electric motor interact. The gas engine is a three-cylinder, one-liter, 12-valve mill that includes many sophisticated features that work together to improve fuel economy and reduce emissions. The electric motor on the inside is sandwiched, believe it or not, right down there between the engine and transmission. Now it can either assist the engine in power production or it can switch function and recharge the 144 volt nickel metal hydride battery that sits in the trunk. On its own, the engine churns out 67 horsepower and 66 pounds feet of torque. With the assistance of the electric motor, these numbers rise to 73 and 91 respectively. While these may seem a little on the low side, performance is more than acceptable, easily keeping up with the normal flow of traffic. Inside is powered by both engine and motor under acceleration and high load situations, and the engine alone when cruising. Under deceleration or braking, the electric motor is used to recharge the battery. This process not only puts otherwise wasted energy to good use, it also delivers strong engine braking, which in turn reduces the workload on the conventional brake system. In this case, a front disc rear drum design with standard anti-lock. When you pull up to a stoplight or stop sign and you take your foot off the clutch and put it into neutral, the engine is automatically shut down. It's part of the fuel economy strategy. However, when the light changes, it's time to go, dip the clutch, put it in gear, and we're out of here. The five-speed manual gearbox was specifically developed for Insight. The throws are short, the gate clearly defined, and the clutch buttery smooth, with the bite point in the perfect spot. In other words, typically Honda. There are, however, a couple of quibbles. First of all, the radio needs rear speakers. Without them, it sounds real thin. The second thing is that the fuel economy gauge, well, it converts to miles per US gallon. So when you've got a 4.8 litre per 100 kilometre reading, it says you're getting 48.8 miles to the gallon. You're not. You're actually getting that, 58.8. You'd think that a simple conversion would be a piece of cake for a car this sophisticated. Insight's McPherson strut and twist beam rear suspension delivers a ride that's on the firm side and steps away from Honda's double wishbone philosophy. The latter, when combined with the diminished rear track and low rolling resistance tires, hinders the overall handling somewhat. Inside, the Insight has a clean, modern, almost conventional appearance. The front seats are form-fitting and comfortable, and the dash and instrument panel are logical. Being a two-seater, the rear half of the car is dedicated to storing the main battery and 142 litres of luggage. Unfortunately, the tallest battery delivers a shallow floor. You know, anyone into economy has got to love this new Insight, because it's very easy to attain an average of 60 miles per gallon without trying. 
drive with a light foot and who knows what you could get, maybe even 88 miles per gallon. But you know the challenge Honda face is convincing prospective customers that the unusual look and limited interior space are worth those dramatic numbers. Personally though, I find the thought of getting over a thousand kilometers out of a 40 litre gas tank very appealing. Our Midas tip of the week concerns washer fluid. A lot of people are tempted after winter's over to just top up that washer fluid bottle with straight water. I don't think it's a good idea for a couple of reasons. First of all, when you water down the solution, if you forget about it next fall, it'll freeze up when you need it the most, and that happens to a lot of people. Secondly, water alone isn't a good enough grease cutter to get that bug grime and oil off your windshield in the summertime. So I think it's important to use the right fluid. A lot of fluids are specially formulated for summer use. They're usually pink in color, but don't always rely on the color because there is one winter fluid that's good for minus 40 freeze protection that's also kind of a salmony color. So make sure you keep track of what's going into that container. And one more tip, make sure you take a clean rag and saturate it with full strength washer fluid and draw it along the side of your wiper element, the rubber element on your wiper blade to clean off all that crud that gets accumulated on the side of the blades. It'll make for much better wiper performance. That's your Midas tip of the week. In the rear end you've got tail lights that look like flames coming out and uh, the backup lights look like an exhaust port off a jet airplane. It was just a, the popular Vogue and it sold cars. It's a 1959 Cadillac, um, and it's pink, and uh, generally the 1959 Cadillac is a collectible car around the world, and it's because it represents the height of the tail fin era. Um, there were, through the 50s, the tail fin wars began by Cadillac, and then everybody joined the fray, and then Cadillac took it to its ultimate, and they never got that high again. After that, the wars were over, and most cars started dropping them. So Cadillac with the tallest fins, the 59 becomes special. In the late 50s we have the jet age beginning. Boeing 707s are coming out and they're starting to fly and it's really captured the public imagination. So the car companies aren't, aren't stupid and so they picked up on jet styling themes for automobiles. Um, the front parking lights look like air intakes off a 707. In the rear end you've got tail lights that look like flames coming out and uh, the backup lights look like an exhaust port off a jet airplane. It was just the popular Vogue and it sold cars. It's got a 390 cubic inch engine with 325 horsepower. It's a powerful engine, but then it's a heavy car. It's about 5,000 pounds. So it needs all of that horsepower to get it moving. Well, the problem is, is that they're being sold overseas. Um, they're very popular around the world because it's something of an American icon, an icon for cars. And they're being imported to Germany and Sweden and uh, Italy, Austria, Japan. Um, Australia. Uh, recently I was at an auction where a collection of 15 59 Cadillacs were sold and 13 went overseas. It's just a very popular car to, to, uh, to own abroad. I think too if you think about the history of it, after the war most of the great automobile countries weren't building very good cars except for America. So if you want a great 1950s car it almost has to be American. What did it cost in 1959 and what kind of check would I have to write you to get it out of your hands today? It cost $5,700 in 1959 and it would take about $25,000 today. This is the dealership in Ottawa that Charlene Hayes credits for giving her her first break which eventually led to her getting her Class A mechanics license. And you know I just spoke to the service manager John Minot and he says they're always looking for good mechanics but he did have some advice. In this high-tech world, he said it's important to, one, stay in school, learn computers, and one thing that hasn't changed over the last hundred years, you got to have a passion for working on cars. All right, let's head to the garage and join Bill Gardner. Bill? Well, that's true, Brad, and I'll add one more point, and that's I'm a firm believer in the fact that your first couple of uh, vehicles, whatever type of machinery you're talking about, whether it's car, motorcycle, pickup, van, whatever, your first piece of machinery when you're a young mechanic or aspiring apprentice, it should be a piece of junk, a real piece of scrap that you can fix up right from scratch. You've got to rip it top to bottom to fix it up. That's your best way to learn. You can't learn on brand new machinery. It just doesn't make sense to be ripping a brand new piece of equipment apart. So even if you can afford a new piece of equipment, resist the temptation, buy junk, fix it up, you'll learn a lot more. And uh, the car that we're talking about today has got a major problem. Maybe it'd be a perfect fixer-upper for somebody. It's got a broken crankshaft extremely rare problem today we're lucky if we see uh, 
if we see one car every year or two like this, that would be about uh, the limit of it. It's very rare. This one will actually run with the crankshaft broken. We're going to have a look at it and talk a little bit about the crankshaft. Now the car that we're working on is a Toyota Camry with a V6 engine. It's a double overhead cam V6, 24 valve engine, very sophisticated little engine and it's a real sweet running engine, or certainly it was before the crankshaft let go. Now uh, if we have a look down there at the crankshaft pulley, I've taken the fan belts off, start it up, you notice the crankshaft pulley wobbling like crazy, shut it off, you can really see it wobbling. Go ahead and start it again and there's a lot of clanking and banging going on in this engine that, that shouldn't be happening. Okay, shut it off. And it's extremely rare for an engine to run with a broken crankshaft, let alone for it to happen in the first place. Now it's going to require some pretty major repairs. We're probably going to have to pull the engine out and strip all the accessories off it to uh, replace that crankshaft. Here's a crankshaft that we replaced about six months ago. It was sitting outside so it got all rusty. Normally they look pretty highly polished and shiny because they're inside the engine and totally bathed in lubricant. But uh, you can see as you look along this crankshaft, all these journals that are in line with the center line of the crankshaft are called the main journals. There's five in this particular crank. And the ones that are offset from the center are the ones that the connecting rods are on and those go up and attach to your pistons. And you can see some uh, oil holes that are drilled in the crankshaft to allow the engine oil to pass through and get to all the uh, crank and rod bearings in this uh, crankshaft. And you can see the counterweights here that uh, balance the reciprocating weight in our engine so that our engine runs smoothly at high RPM. The purpose of the crankshaft is to convert the reciprocating motion of the pistons and con rods flying up and down in the engine into the rotary motion that you need to turn the, propel the rear wheels of the car. Now, when you start your car in the morning, there's a large gear attached to the back of the crankshaft here. The starter motor propels that gear around, cranks the engine over to get it to start. Once it's started and running, the uh, force that's being applied to the pistons and connecting rods motorizes the crankshaft, turns it around, and it revolves on these five main bearings. And these four journals here in this V8 crankshaft each have two connecting rods on them and go up and attach to the pistons inside the engine. Now, these crankshafts, when they're in service, can be repaired. They can be machined and reground to uh, restore the engine when you're rebuilding it. I think what we're going to find on that Camry is that the crankshaft was worked on. We know that the engine was rebuilt about a year ago and I suspect that the crankshaft was probably welded. Now when I say welded, I'm not talking about welding back together a broken crankshaft. When one of these journals gets damaged beyond the point that it can be machined, they can add material to it by welding material onto that journal and then grind it back down to get back down to a workable size and put in oversized bearings. to you know, save that engine. The crankshaft for the Camry, we just priced it out the other day, $790 for a new one. So you can see why you'd want to be able to try and machine a used one to keep it in service. These things can last for hundreds of thousands of kilometers in a uh, car that's used for street use. Now the racers, guys like IndyCar guys, they change crankshafts at a predetermined mileage because they're under so much stress, they know that at a certain point they're going to break. Now, obviously on the Camry, we exceeded that point. I think what we're going to find, though, is that, that likely it broke at the weakest link, probably where it was welded to repair that damaged journal. And uh, it's a pretty major job, so we're looking at lots of labor to get that thing out. It's going to be a pretty expensive job. Perfect kind of job for one of those automotive apprentices that wants to fix her upper car. That's the kind of thing you buy. Fix it yourself. Your, your time is uh, your own. You're just having to buy parts. You can sometimes get a deal on those too. So that's why I say when you're learning the trade, you want to be driving scrap. I certainly did myself. Matter of fact, I still am driving scrap. Anyhow, till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2000. I gave a little talk on traffic safety recently to the National Association of Fleet Administrators. This is a professional group of people that look after fleets of cars and trucks for private and public organizations across the country. One of the points I made was that the most significant industrial accident situation we face in this country is no longer workers chopping their hands off or falling into vats of acid. We made a lot of progress in those areas. The most dangerous thing facing workers is driving to and from work. Now, after the speech, I was approached by Major Catherine Vigneault of the Canadian Armed Forces. She looks after the motor pool at 36,000 vehicles, the largest fleet in this country, and it ranges from family sedans to armored personnel carriers to tanks. And she gave to me what I consider to be very surprising news. 
that the most dangerous thing for a soldier isn't bombs, bullets, or landmines, it's driving. They kill and injure more soldiers in traffic crashes than they do from any other single cause. Now, a lot of army driving is done under very dangerous circumstances. You're on a treacherous mountain pass in a troop transport in Bosnia someplace with no guardrails. But a lot of that driving is done near and on army bases right here in this country. And like most traffic crash situations, the biggest problem is driver error. Now, the army experience suggests to me that we have to really look at traffic crashes not in isolation, but as part of a broader issue. Ministries of health in this country have to understand that traffic crashes are the cause of the biggest component of their cost. So they should be looking at preventing this type of crash. If companies are truly concerned about the welfare of the workers, the concern can't begin and end at the factory gate. It's got to begin at the garage door of the worker. Now, we still kill in this country enough people to make, make the equivalent of the Swiss air crash off Peggy's Cove every single month. What's worse, we're killing people up to the age of 44. It's the biggest single issue for people of that age. So if we looked at productive years lost and not just lives lost, it would be an even bigger issue. We have to make this a front page deal if we're going to marshal the resources necessary to really address the issue. Now, Major Vigno and the Canadian Army have all sorts of programs in place to improve driver safety within the Army. They understand the nature of this problem. I just wish everybody did. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, school is still in here at MacArthur High in Ottawa, and that includes Charlene Hayes' automotive class. And you know, Charlene mentioned that one of the reasons she enjoys teaching so much is that these students want to be here. They want a career in the automotive world. Well, all I can say is if the students have as much patience and perseverance that Charlene has had all her life, they will do just fine. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. The reason the VR6 is in the car is because of the sound and uh, part of the objective with the new Beetle Cup both in Europe and in North America is to uh, um, give the Beetle a little more t testosterone, make it, make it a little more manly and uh, I think they've done a good job with, with what they've done with the Cup cars. I like how it's real roomy and all and I like the way the front end is set up and, and the tailgate but I don't know from the side view it looks kind of I guess I don't like the, the, hatchback. the hatchback look to it. it, it I don't know, it looks kind of weird. TSN's Motoring 2000 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.